Hey gang, Sean from The Good Dog. How the heck are you guys all doing? See this tiny little coffee here? Some might even call it dainty. Three shots for your protection. Um, there might have been a bigger one that preceded this, but we'll just go with this. I have a tiny little glass of wine just to kind of like I'll take the edge off of the night. Busy day. Mm-hmm. I'll go back and forth between coffee and wine. It's perfectly okay. Anyways, how are you all doing? Um, took me a while to get this one all framed up. Hopefully I'm in the screen. Hopefully you can see everything and I'm not like cut off or lopsided or anything like that. But before we jump into the fun, good, you know, questions and like updates, I wanted to talk to you guys about something really important, really serious, really quick. And that's, we just had a client come in the other day um, with this really cute, young, pity, and a smart client, um, done a lot of research, and the research she came up with had led her in the direction of pure positive reward-based, uh, you know, uh, uh, force-free training. Um, she had ended up seeing uh, numerous veterinary behaviorists. If you don't know what that, what they are, look them up. Um, basically, the upshot is they are incredibly expensive. Um, to have you come over and um, come into their office, bring your dog, um, and they have you fill out a you know a whole bunch of stuff and you know a bunch of evaluation stuff, and um, they never touch a dog, right? So like you want to talk about a gig, right? And 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 there's a kicker here too, right? So somebody's got a dog problem aggression, fear, anxiety, you know, reactivity, whatever. Bring the dog to the veterinary behaviors. We've got some of the biggest credentials going and they sit you down and they do the evaluation, fill out the forms, make sure they get like a real clear understanding, real, real clear insight into what's cooking with you and your dog. And once again, they don't touch your dog. They don't work your dog. They don't train your dog. They don't handle a leash, they don't put themselves in any kind of position at risk or to actually even interact and get a feel for your animal. <laughs> Took me a lot of finger wagging in this one. It's shocking. She was $700 an hour for these sessions, right? So just like any of you, I'm sure some of you watching just went, holy crap, right? So 700 bucks, she saw multiple that are narrow behaviorists. This is the typical, this is not the exception, this is the typical. They don't work with your dogs, they charge you an awful lot of money for a very small amount of time, and then they recommend medication for your dog. And they probably recommend avoidance, how to keep your dog under threshold, how to keep your dog, you know, avoiding triggers so that it doesn't make things worse. So you just, it's basically an avoidance an avoidance approach and a medication band-aid approach based on a technique and a methodology and approach that actually doesn't work so but if you apply all of these things the way they ask you to they kind of like you know it's like smoke and mirrors they kind of steer you away from ever having to find out the truth that like holy crap this doesn't really work from there, after seeing multiple veterinary behaviorists, <clears throat> spending gobs and gobs and gobs of money, being really frustrated, really sad. She's got this great dog that she's really trying to work with and the dog is lunging at people's faces, hasn't actually taken a piece out of anybody, but is lunging up in a real anxious kind of like nervous way and like teeth are touching people. So it's getting pretty hairy. Um, then she starts seeing pure positive trainers. What do they do? What do you think they do? Pure positive means positive reinforcement only. No aversives, no 
knows no corrections, no consequences, no punishment for negative, unhealthy, dangerous behaviors, anything like that. So if you understand positive reinforcement, you understand that the only thing that can come from that is reinforcement, right? So you might be thinking, well, that's cool because you could reinforce your dog to do something other than bite. Well, the problem is, is that doesn't teach your dog not to bite. It just teaches your dog, I'd like you to do sit, or I'd like you to, you know, give paw instead of like bite the person. But it doesn't inhibit the dog from biting the person just because it trains paw or goes to place. Yes, obedience commands and yes, having some of that stuff in place can help, but unless you inhibit it, unless you actually address it, you're not going to fix the dog. You're not going to stop the behaviors. And what ends up happening is, far far worse than just not stopping them is the other side when the other shoe drops and that's the reinforcement reward, reward process and that's what ended up happening with this client is that every time her dog did something negative unhealthy antisocial whatever she was you know just plied with food over and over and over again what was happening was she was being reinforced rewarded and being taught that that was the behavior that they wanted and so rather than get leadership rather than get clear information rather than get clear structure rather than get clear consequences like all of us need about how do you move through life what's wrong what's right what's safe what's not no, we're not going to give them any of that. We're just going to give them positive reinforcement to create associations of good feelings with things that they're not comfortable with. Right? So we're not going to teach them, don't do that because it's dangerous. We're not going to say, here's a consequence for making that choice. We're going to say, here's food when you're around things that make you uncomfortable because we want you to feel better about it. Guys, it doesn't work. 90% of the people that show up on our couch, that's been, that's been their experience. Luckily, most of them haven't spent as much money as that. And like I said, this is not an uneducated, dumb person. This is someone who's done a ton of research and their research is all basing it on science. So if you're a smart person, you're doing your research out there and you're like, well, this is all science, you know, modern, contemporary, at the highest level based documents to prove it, blah, 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 blah. That's what you're going to go with, right? And we all sat there. The whole team was sitting there with our mouths open like $700 for an hour session. They didn't touch your dog. And all they do is recommend medication and an avoid and avoidance. Are you freaking kidding me? Where do I sign up for that gig? Like if I had no soul and no ethics, I would be signing on the dotted line because all you're doing is collecting giant paychecks and you're not helping dogs and you're not helping owners and you're not helping the dog owning community at large by sharing true information. It's bullshit. So anyways, I wanted to share that with you guys. The, the dog is doing great. The dog is getting a very simpler program. There's no PhDs behind it. There's no big dissertations or big, you know, like, you know, programs and testing in laboratories to try and get it straight. It's very simple dog training stuff, leadership structure, rules, accountability, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's so damn simple. And yet people want to elevate it to such a place where it's so complicated in order to feed their egos, in order to substantiate themselves, in order to feel better and more worthwhile and all that stuff and to make a lot of money anyways that I just wanted to share with you if you are having trouble with your dogs dog or dogs do not go to a veterinary behaviorist do not spend gobs and gobs of money for someone to not actually touch work with your dog or do anything of any kind of real value with your dog and do not let them put your dog on medication as a first line of defense if you've listened to me, you know I have opinions about medication and I am not anti-medication, but I am anti-medication as the first line of defense. I'm anti-medication without doing really hard, uh, 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 top line, heavy duty, uh, like the, the best, I lost for words, um, high, there it is, high end dog training with really qualified experienced professionals then if you're struggling jump on the meds no problem or if you're one of those gidget if you're one of those who has a dog that completely can't focus and concentrate which are like the one to two to three percenters 
then medication to help take the edge off so they can concentrate and do the work, that's acceptable as well. But I also know that my friend Gidget did a ton, a shit ton of work before she ever went to the medication route. Anyways, I wanted to share that with you guys. Please be careful out there. There's so many people happy to take your money, lots and lots of it, and give you zero results and give you zero true, tangible, realistic, practical, real world things that you can apply to your dog and your life and actually make good things happen. So that's a warning for you guys out there. And it, you know, it bummed the whole team out just hearing like this really nice lady with this dog that could have been like in such a different space already dealing with spending all that money and just, it's just, it's just BS. It's just crap. Anyways. Okay. So let's move on to some nicer stuff. So we've got the uh, NOLA audiobook. Uh, I'm traveling down on uh, the 3rd, um, which I've been told several times it's not this weekend. And um, by Liz, who's in the kitchen there. Um, so going down on the 3rd, going to spend a week down there, probably four to five days of uh, recording. I just sent out a cool Facebook message today asking for you guys to share all of your best ideas that you'd like to hear included in the book. So that's super exciting. There's been some really great ideas already thrown around. So that is going to be a blast because we're going to dive really deep in the audiobook. It, I'm going to, of course, read off all the information. Liz, are you trying to distract me from my TV show? I think she is. I, I, think, she's, I think she's trying to steal the limelight. So anyways... The audiobook is going to be, of course, all the content, all that stuff. Going to read it in my own voice, going to do all that stuff. But then we're also going to find some really cool angles and different things that we can share with you guys that I think will be special and really valuable. And we're going to hopefully borrow some of the stuff that you shared with us. Digital book. I know I keep saying it every week. It's supposed to be out. Um, we've had some technical difficulties, but we're working our butts off. Or I should say Brian, our mastermind behind all of the tech stuff, is working his butt off. And, uh, you know, we've been in contact and it's really close to getting done. So once that once that hits, I know for a lot of you folks, you'll be extremely happy because then you can kind of get around the... Um, uh, get around the shipping uh, issues if it's expensive for you, if you live far away. And I know a lot of folks just really dig having an, a, a digital version on their Kindle or something like that or their iPod, uh, iPod iPad so they can take it with them. So, uh, so that's going to be fantastic. Um, things are looking good. New Orleans and LA. Um, business is booming in both cities. We're really excited. Things are starting to really like blow up, really jump. Um, we're so happy that people are, are, are sending their dogs to us and trusting us and allowing us to work a little magic with their dogs. So um, excited about that. The team is growing. The team is just so good and I'm so proud of everybody that we've got going on right now. So awesome, beautiful stuff. Um, and then we're ordering new books, another another delivery, uh, another whole shipment. We are coming to the end of the first uh, shipment, which was not crazy. I mean, we're not talking about Stephen King books. Um, I'm sure Stephen orders bigger, um, bigger, bigger bulk. Uh, but we're looking at, you know, we we're already blowing through our first thousand books, which for us, a small little, you know, mom and pop thing pretty damn cool. So we're just about to uh, pull the trigger on ordering our second thousand books. And this is without even going like in a big way, like through Amazon or anything. This is just through our website and our own kind of personal promotion. So pretty damn exciting. Thank you all for buying the book. Thank you all for supporting. Thank you all for taking pictures. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you all for the great reviews and the PMs and the emails. And I mean, somebody posted today and said, you know, finally got my book. I'm halfway in. And um, not only is it fantastically laid out, but it's the best dog training book I've ever read. And this is like somebody with like a lot of experience. It's, it's truly humbling. So, um, Thank you guys all from the bottom of my heart, Laura's heart. Uh, we, we put our heart and souls into making that a special book and um, just so, so, so happy that you guys are enjoying it. So, and all of you holding on that are like, where is mine? They're coming, I promise they're coming. We're, we're you know, we're, we're getting them out and the further you, the further you live, 
um, or the later you kind of order in the sequence, obviously it's, it's gonna take a little bit longer, but we're pretty much all caught up now, so things should be happening in a fairly timely fashion. Anyways, that's kind of the, uh, the, um, the poop. That's what's going on. And uh, so let me introduce the show and um, let's see if I can do it right this time and then we'll jump into the questions. All right, you guys ready? All right. I can never, literally, we're on the 136th episode and I'm like, it still befuddles me. Anyways, hey everybody, it's Sean from The Good Dog and... Well, not to up to me. Used to be Laura Morgan, but she's at home because she's busy and doing her own stuff. So, it's just an empty couch. Uh, all the stuff you can't see, which is a bunch of dogs hanging out. Um, Annie, Belle, and Malu make up the Good Dogs Q&A Saturday, episode number 136. I'm not even gonna do it backwards this time because I think I'm doing it right, so, so we're cool. Um, so, awesome, thanks for joining us again, and uh, let's see if we can jump in. We got some really good questions today, and uh, hopefully we can um, share some good info with you guys. All right, ready? Laura, take it away. Hey guys, nice to see you. You can hear me talking a little bit soft because the baby's in the other room taking a nap, which, is perfect for Q&A. So I'm gonna jump right to it. I don't really have anything to let you guys know about. I was so exciting about all the stuff that Sean's talking about. I mean, that's really probably the most exciting stuff that's going on in my life as well, besides the baby nap. Um, but no, I mean, everything's cool. Same old stuff, uh, baby's getting older, getting more mobile, so there's a lot more um, movement going on, a lot less holding, and a lot more kind of like going after and trying to make sure that plastic bags aren't grabbed constantly. So, I'm gonna jump into the show. We've got question number one comes from Kara. Kara says, I'm a veterinarian who wholeheartedly believes in balanced training, not purely positive training. Wow, that's that's unique. Um, awesome, Kara. There's a new initiative in the veterinary community called Fear Free, which is an amazing concept, making vet visits positive for patients with tasty treats, gentle touch, doing exams on the floor if possible, and yes, even muzzle conditioning prior to the visit. I implement these techniques every day in my exam rooms, but the Fear Free certified veterinarians, along with the boarded veterinarian behaviorists, all swear 100% by purely positive training and anything else is abusive, and any other veterinarian that believes otherwise should not be allowed to be Fear Free certified. I can make exams less stressful, but many of these stressed, anxious dogs lack confidence, structure, and social skills, and that's when I recommend working with a balanced trainer. What is your recommendation or advice to vets that train rehabilitate like you and believes in your methods but are outcasts within their own profession how can we help educate boarded vet behaviorists um, that purely positive is not made for every dog it's the number one reason i can't become boarded and behavior and it sucks i would love to take out this fear-free initiative and how to help open up some minds within this professional community thank you you're the best awesome okay so kara is uh, a vet and she's talking about this uh, this new movement, which uh, vets are, are incorporating, and I don't, I have to be honest, I only know so much about it, but it's a fear free movement. Excuse me, so much uh, fear free movement, which is all about trying to make vet vet experiences for animals less stressful, more relaxing, more calm, um, just less anxiety inducing, just a more pleasant experience, right? So. She's diving deep into this. She also believes in balanced training and is catching hell from uh, a ton of people in her industry. So it's not unusual. Most vets are leaning towards the side of pure positive. I, I, you know, I wish I had like a great like answer for why they're doing that. All I can think of is that for them, for most of them that are not doing a lot of critical thinking on their own, they're just, they're just running with what is like science 
or, or put under the umbrella of science. And so they just kind of feel safe probably moving within those circles because it's what they're used to kind of coming up with. So I applaud all vets that are actually being open-minded and instead of just like, this is what we're told, looking at what works for their clients. And I know you're not training dogs, vets, but looking at, most well, maybe some of you are, but looking at what is helping your clients and then instead of, making them feel bad, empowering them to use tools that actually help them, send them to trainers that help them, you know, like let's lift each other up, let's help them do better, let's stop shaming clients into doing things and using tools and approaches that cause them to struggle and suffer. What the hell is going on? Why are we doing this? Why is dog welfare which is not really dog welfare because it's dogs suffering by through bad behavior why is that prioritized over dogs and humans having a great relationship and a great lifestyle and living in harmony i i've got no idea anyways you can tell this is going to be a bit of a, a spicy ranty one so um so what do i have here for kara um Basically, for one, I can I can kind of dig it, you know. Um, me and several other folks in this line of work, um, we know what it's like to be chastised and to be, you know, catching a lot of heat and have a lot of people not happy with us and a lot of people slamming us and a lot of people saying nasty crap about us and a lot of people going after us. But that's really like, it's kind of cool you know I was talking with Jeff Gelman today and we were talking about some friction we're receiving about our UK trip and I'm just like man it's so cool that what we've done has created enough controversy not for controversy's sake but because it's different because it's pushing the envelope that people are upset about it people are up in arms people are trying to stop it that means change is happening. That means change is afoot. And I would say for vets that care about balanced training, that care about um, being able to help bring in this fear-free movement and yet keep dogs in a good space by like, you know, this vet saying, recommending balanced trainers and things like that. Just know you're, know you're in for a fight. Know that it's not going to be easy. Know that anything worthwhile, anything valuable, anything that pushes against the status quo is going to involve friction, pain, and struggle, and probably a lot of derision and criticism, and that's just the way it's going to be. We were just talking with the shadow students today, and I was just like, you know what it was like when me and Jeff were coming up, you know, like eight, nine years ago talking about duration place command and everybody on all the dog training forums were like, that's the dumbest thing we've ever heard. Why would you do that? And now like everybody's doing duration work. So if what's the saying? First they, uh, first they laugh at you, then they, you know, uh, then, then they are scared of you, and then they want to be be you. Something, something along those lines. I'm, I'm sure I butchered it, but it's really the case. So, what I'd say, Kara, is <sighs> what I have. I'm just. I, w I want to get the right stuff out for you, so it's not like I'm like stuck. I'm just like I want to make sure I have a few notes here, and I really want to make sure I hit them. I understand that seeing what works and not being able to do it is torture. It's the worst thing in the world. And I don't know how you deal with it. I don't know, I, I wouldn't be able to deal with it. So I applaud you for trying to find your way navigating through that. Um, but knowing that there's a better way to help dogs and that you can't do it really is torture. So I'm wishing you the very best. I'm wishing you strength and confidence and courage to move forward. You've said some really, really, really nice things about our videos and that they've helped so much. I wish I could do something that could wave a magic wand and cause people to feel differently, but I can't. All I can do is say that we're all kind of in this together and the more we all keep pushing, it's changing. It is changing. The culture of dog training is uh, like 
from where I was 10 years ago and what I was seeing, it's changing massively. Social media is changing everything. So you can't hide the information, you can't hide the knowledge anymore, it's coming out. So what do you say we all fight the good fight? We take our lumps, right? Anything worth fighting for is worth having you know some lumps for. So let's take our lumps. I know it's preventing you from getting where you wanna go with some of your certification and things like that, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, but you're gonna to have to figure out integrity wise what you wanna do, what sits right with you, and what decisions you wanna to make to best take care of your mind, heart, your soul, and then make decisions from there. That's about the best we can do, and that's what I try and do every day here. And um, it ain't always easy, lots of folks gunning for you, but that means you're probably doing something right. So I hope that helps. Yeah, I mean, everything Sean said, I think you know, doing your own education through videos and all that stuff is really gonna be the key. Um, if that Fear Free Initiative is only around pure positive, I really just don't think you're ever going to change their minds. You're not going to be like, guys, trust me, it's great. Just create your own initiative and, and talk about it on your website and educate your clients. And you can also educate why the Fear Free Initiative is cool, but it's lacking one really strong component. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention, um, I think Sean mentioned it, but you know, treats and touch and things like that, exams on the floor are, are, exams on the floor can be super dangerous and also really invasive for a dog that's uncomfortable with that. And treats, some dogs don't want to treats or to be touched or anything like that. So I can see where the gaps are in this initiative and it's a cool idea. You know, um, I like the muzzle conditioning thing, but more than anything, we just need no high pitched talking. We need no like trying to be the dog's friend. We need no like getting into their space um, to try to like create relationship. Obviously you have to do your thing as a vet, but those are the things that I would start. I'd start your own, just start your own with those things. And if you have any more questions on that, you can always hit us up and we can, we can outline some more things that would help the dogs that I know we see come through and what that would help uh, them big time. So cool. Um, okay, question number two. This comes from Heather. Heather says, I know there's technically no such thing as spite peeing, but my dog does something very close to that. She was at the vet Friday, so she doesn't have a UTI. She knows exactly where she should be going to the bathroom and walked on a regular schedule. I've even walked her less than five minutes before a spite pee and it still happens. One example was she was playing with a very loud squeaky toy. It was 11 at night and I live in an apartment building, so I took it from her and replaced it with a rope toy. I didn't rip it out of her mouth. I just kind of like took it from laying in front of her. Less than a minute later, she walked away and peed. My dog also likes to sleep on the bed with me, but I make sure that she asks politely by like sitting calmly, um, making eye contact. And sometimes she pushes the boundary and just tries to jump up and she will get frustrated and walk, go in the other room and pee. I know there's no science behind spiteful peeing, but she's obviously mad that she's not getting her way. Thanks so much, your videos are awesome. Also, sorry if you've answered the question already. I wasn't sure how to search the Q&A sessions. I think we have answered this bratty P question um, before, but it's always great to repeat it, so. Okay, thank you, Laura Morgan. So, number two, Heather, Heather Croy. She's got a really interesting one. I like this question, and I don't, I don't, I don't think I've seen it come up before. Spite P, spite P. Can dogs be capable of spiteful urination? good question. I tend to go against a lot of conventional dog training and dog lifestyle and dog kind of um, beliefs that are commonly accepted. So much like Heather, uh, I do believe that I I've seen dogs, I've seen dogs do fearful peeing, excited peeing, and I've also seen them do, oh really? peeing and so I truly believe that the right dog with the right attitude dealing with a situation that it doesn't like that spiteful peeing is absolutely on the table there's a reason why that you'll see like cats will do it um, dogs will do it hop up on your bed 
you know what I mean? Like after an interaction or maybe um, after someone's been there, like a boyfriend or girlfriend, and they're like up on your bed and they're like, what do you think of them apples, right? So I am a believer in spiteful peeing and like the whole dog training community, come on, come on, come after me. I'm ready for it. Um, I've seen it. And, and unless somebody can prove me wrong, I know there's all sorts of folks that are like, dogs aren't capable of those kind of, don't you BS me. Dogs are so much smarter than everybody gives them credit for that I'm just so like, I'm so done with all of this, like treating them like they're such simpletons and they're, they're, not, they're not capable of more complex emotions and things like that. And it's just, uh, it's, so much silliness has been propagated, guys, that, the best thing you can do is just watch. Just watch, forget the noise, forget the books, forget the like, don't forget my book, forget the other books, forget all of the Google crap and just watch the dog. And what does it feel like, right? Don't project a bunch of bullshit onto it, but watch the dog and what does it feel like? Okay, I just took his thing away. He just went out for a pee a few minutes ago and now he just walked over and went, what do you think? I mean, do we need Columbo on the case to like sort this out? No, spiteful peeing, it's coming to a home near you. <laughs> hopefully not on your carpet, hopefully on hardwood floors. Anyways, that's my feeling on it. I do believe that it is there. I do believe it's real. And um, it doesn't happen with every dog. Lots of dogs do it because they're excited and have bladder control issues or they're fearful and they have bladder control issues because they're fearful. And then there's those guys that are just those little mother suckers and they're just like, hmm, I got a little special secret little treat for you. You'll find it when you step in it. Anyways, all right, uh, I know it's gonna put me at odds with everybody, but I'm willing to take the heat. Okay, let's hit, let's hit the next one. Okay, so question number three is for me. Um, it comes from my Jean. My Jean says, quick question, I have a completely off leash with e-collar trained dog via your DVD. So I trained him with low level pressure then corrected with quick higher stims, but how should I be reminding him to heal during structured walks? Common occurrences now include reminding him to come back to heel position when he gets ahead of me, maybe once, twice per walk, and keep him from loading or becoming fearful of passing dogs and strangers. I had this under control, but just started reacting. He just started reacting on walks again. I've been walking him without a leash for several months, just on e-collar. Thanks. So with this, uh, my assumption, I'm kind of reading this. I, I get the idea that he's off leash but he's walking in a heel. You're, you're correcting him for walking ahead of the heel and for looking at strangers and doing all that stuff. My guess is that maybe you're just not on him enough um, because it's so cool to have this off leash trained dog. Maybe you're having like, you're just excited and you, if he moves a little out of it, it's like, ah, oh, it's no big deal, he's not on a leash. What I would say is if you're walking him off leash or on leash and you want him to be more on that heel, you just have to correct it like you did at the very start when you were teaching him. You almost have to go back to basics. You're not gonna go back to basics using pressure, of course, but you do have to go back to basics in terms of correcting him for every little tiny infraction. So if he moves like an inch ahead, you wanna correct then. You don't wanna wait till he's too far out. Same with the looking at strangers and things like that. You wanna correct, ooh, I forgot to show you guys nails. Nails. Um, so yeah, as soon as he kind of looks at the stranger, that's when you wanna correct. As soon as he moves kind of out of the position, that's when you wanna correct. You, I, it just seems like maybe things have gotten a little lax, probably because he's being really good. Any dog that's being walked off leash primarily, you, that's like you're in a, a really awesome situation. So I would just say, go back to basics. You're not starting over in terms of teaching him, but definitely you're starting over in terms of uh, holding him accountable like you did at the beginning. Um, yeah. So if he's starting to react again, it's probably just looseness in what you're doing and um, you just need to kick it up a notch. No big deal. All right, my Jean, I think you know what you need to do. Okay, thanks. Okay, Laura Morgan. What a fantastic answer that was. I, you know, I knew you had it in, I knew, I knew you had it in you, but hey, Manny, what's up, bud? Please don't trip over the camera. Nope, 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 sorry guys. Let me just move this bowling ball away. Man, go lay down. Thank you, bud. So awesome, uh, awesome, awesome, 
Can I say it one more time? Awesome response, Laura Morgan. Um, yeah. Um, to be honest, I haven't heard a response. I just know it's. I just know it's awesome. But I'm sure she said something akin to. If, if your dog is off leash, you're gonna have to hold them highly accountable with your e-collar. If you put a prong collar on, you'll probably get a lot less monkey business than you're getting. Um, and it'll be a lot easier and safer. And uh, dogs know when the leash is on and when the leash is off, and they know what they can start to flex and push against. So, um, you know, if you want something better with a with an off-leash shield, you're gonna have to really be on top of your dog and make sure that, like, don't let them get way out. Correct them right away. I think I'm like hijacking her question. And uh, and then if that keeps happening, put a leash and prong on and have an easy breezy thing, unless you want to show off and be fancy pants style. So, anyways, uh, I'm sure Laura answered that in an awesome way. But um, anyways, Laura Morgan, uh, take it away and let's have question number four. Okay, question four comes from David. David says, hey Sean, I think you might have touched on this before, but I need some guidance. I've been volunteering for an animal rescue group assessing new dogs that they get. I'm very happy to do it for them, but I do stress to them that I'm not a trainer and I only have experience working dogs, working with dogs. From following you guys all these years, I've picked up some tidbits of your wisdom that's super helpful, but what is the best way for me to assess a dog that has recently come out of a shelter? What's some advice that you would give to the foster and animal rescue group? They look to me for guidance and support, and I want to do the best that I can. Thanks for all that you do. Shalom for now. Okay, this comes from our old friend, David Pearl. David is a dog walker, and he, and he definitely like helps folks out with you know some dog training stuff. I think he probably considers himself more of a dog walker than a specific dog trainer, but he's studied and is very infatuated with uh, the whole process, learning techniques, concepts with dog stuff. Um, it's also a hell of a, hell of a nice guy. So um, David's one of my favorite guys down there, and when we, whenever we have clients in that area, we'll recommend that they go see David. David. Um, so David's question is, you know, how to better assess rescue dogs. That's a hard one, man. That's a hard one because for one, if we lay, if if we went into like a shelter together or a rescue or whatever together, we could talk about all the nuances and we could point out like all these different things and go like, you, you see that, you see that, and, and we could probably pinpoint a lot of stuff. But we can't do that. So what I want to do is I want to go. I want to. I want to challenge you to go deep, macro, like really dive into the best stuff. You've been around enough dogs that I think you've got some. I think you've got plenty of good stuff to pull from in order to make these assessments. So here's what I got for you. I wrote you a couple notes. First, follow your instincts. I think that that's something that. 99.9999% of people with dog stuff, they, they, they tend to second guess their instincts. They're, they're, they're looking for intellectual stuff of like, well, what do the ears look like? Or how are the eyes? Or is the body rounded? Or is the tail tucked? And like, yes, all of those can be valuable components or pieces of information, but your mind, if you let it, if you let your mind do the same kind of work it does when it assesses human beings or other situations where it where cumulative um, kind of comprehensive information is super important i think what you'll find is that you'll get a feel for a dog without having to like intellectually and i really think it's limited intellectually break down like anytime working with like shadows or anybody else and they're like so the ears are i'm like yeah and it's not that I'm ignoring them, but I'm looking at them in concert with the whole dog. And I'm also looking at them in concert with all the past behavior the dog's done in the last two minutes, five minutes, hour, five days, five months, however long I've been around the dog. So I would love for you, David, to start trusting yourself a little bit more, a little bit more of your instinct. That doesn't mean be reckless and just like, let me try this, but it does mean Try and get out of the intellectual space a little bit 
and, and maybe dance a little bit between it. You need to be there. You need to be present. You need to be analyzing certain things. But I'd really like you to get into an intuitive spot where the, the part of your brain that knows more than your kind of like conscious intellect can take over and actually give you information, vital pieces of, vital pieces of information um, that, can, that can help you far better serve the dog than if you're just strictly in an intellectual space alone. I know for me, um, if people ask me stuff, then I will break it down intellectually as best I can. But to be honest, like the feel and, 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 and trying to get out of like, just like the intellectual headspace helps keep me safe, helps keep, helps keep me on the straight and narrow as far as like really pushing dogs in the right direction. And, uh, and so that's, that's the first thing I'd love for you to just like really, like really work on that. Um, and this kind of just reinforces the same thing, which is just stop being over analytical, right? And I'm not, I'm not hard timing you. I'm just saying like, it's so easy to get in that analysis brain. So most of us do. I'd love for you to like switch gears out of it and just move to a feel space as much as, and I know that sounds nebulous, like a feel space, like, mm, it's like touch of you. No, but we have the ability to look at an animal and feel something more profound than than the sum of all these different like body parts or positions or things like that. Yes, they give us information, but your brain will put those puzzle pieces together better than any intellectual analysis if you will allow yourself to feel it and you'll trust it. So that's the other part. Um, and then also on top of that, uh, and this goes along with feel, is try to feel attitude and demeanor. And it's one of the biggest things, you probably heard me talk about it before, David, but it's one of the biggest things I think folks miss. I think folks look at drive, they look at excitement levels, they look at like, uh, is the dog shy? Is the dog like, you know, you know kind of like more superficial, uh, easy to spot, more just like uh, generic dog stuff, rather than what's the dog's attitude like? What's the dog's personality like? Is the dog like, regardless of its home or environment or patterning, does the dog have a swagger? Or is the dog super sweet, like Belle, right? So like, we watch dogs come through here all the time with all sorts of different attitude and demeanor. And <clears throat> that should have a huge impact on how you assess those dogs. So a dog with a ton of swagger most likely is gonna be a dog that's gonna be more challenging for you, definitely more challenging for a client or a prospective adopter. So if you've got somebody who's really got a lot of dog experience and is like, I kinda of want a challenging dog, somebody high energy and a little pushy so we can go out and like, you know, scale Mount Everest. Okay, that's cool. If you've got somebody that's in the middle to lower space of like, I'm a little more chilled out, a little more relaxed, I'm not the most assertive person in the land, I really don't like to set a ton of rules, then you definitely don't wanna set those folks up with a super assertive dog or even like a medium assertive dog because even that can be too much because those guys, they need enough leadership, structure and rules and accountability delivered in a really believable fashion for them to go like, I got it. I buy in. So I'd say put all these pieces together, go far more by feel, far more by instinct, get out of the just, uh, you know, analytical, intellectual kind of brain, and then also start looking at that same skill set you use whenever you meet a human being, where in a moment you have a feel for like personality, you have a feel for demeanor, because we're so conditioned to do it with other humans. But with dogs, we tend to look at this weird superficial like, oh, he's nice, or oh, he's like excitable, or yeah, but what's going on with like, how does he feel about the way he moves through the world? And this may sound hard to hold on to, like what does Sean mean exactly? But I think if you really dive into it and you really give dogs more credit, you'll find that that stuff is cooking everywhere and that should inform a whole heck of a lot of how you approach that dog how much pressure you share, um, when you remove the pressure, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it should 
you know, how hard you push the dog, how soft you are with the dog, that should all be dependent upon attitude and demeanor. And especially talking once again about placement, who you're gonna place that dog with. Do not place a swaggery dog with a soft, soft cream puff of an owner. It's a disaster. So hope that helps. And um, you know, always rooting for you, man. Hope things are good and uh, keep us posted, okay? Okay, question five comes from Rin Shepherd. Rin Shepherd says, can you describe your e-collar protocol? I've watched videos, read articles, and listened to podcasts, but I'm still nervous about starting e-collar. I understand that you have to teach your dog what the correction means and how to make it stop, but when is the proper time to correct? Do you correct only with non-compliance or do you, is it okay to correct with slow responses as well? I've also read that correcting aggressive reactive behavior can be dangerous because it eliminates the warning signs of distress and can cause a dog to bite without warning since it suppresses the behavior and not the feelings. Is this true? Is there any way to use an e-collar for reactive behavior? Okay, so thank you, Laura Morgan. Um, so this comes from Instagram stories and it's a hard one was Rin Shepherd, and she or he would like us to describe our e-collar protocols. Boy, is that a... That's like a 10 part question. Um, so boy, you are going for the world series of, of, of the ask. Um, let me see if I can make it super duper easy. Okay, so um, our e-collar program protocols are, you know, depending on what's going on with the dog, if we're just talking about basic obedience stuff on e-collar, typically what we do if we're doing a board and train is we do three dogs, three dogs, we do three days of uh, leash and prong in order to pattern, sit down, place, thresholds and crate and teach all those behaviors. But more importantly, we're like really teaching the dog how to be calm, how to relax the dog, how to reset the dog. So that's the first three days. Um, typically for heel, um, for the first walk, we're starting with e-collar. Now that might sound like, well, what are you talking about? So we switch things up a little bit. So our protocols are first day, prong collar on, e-collar on, dog goes out and learns e-collar heel. Um, the reason being e-collar heel with slight mild directional guidance from the prong collar is far easier on 99.99999% of dogs than a prong collar alone is. So that's why we prioritize that all we do is what works. That's what we found works best on walks. Interior wise, when dogs come in and they're used to being kind of frantic and all over the place, we go to uh, leash and prong and we find that the singular, even though this goes flies in the face of what I just said about the, the e-collar heel, because the pressure on the e-collar heel of, 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 the, uh, of the actual e-collar receiver is so novel and different than a prong. It doesn't constrict and doesn't like amp up the dog. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I digress a little bit, but I have to make sure you guys understand why that is rather than prong pops when a dog's like amped up. So that's not what you want on a walk, right? That's why we, that's why we prefer the e-collar because it's a low, more neutral kind of pressure that you give direction to in a very light fashion rather than constricting with a prong collar that can create more amping. So that said, then we do three days of leash and prong and it's singular pressure with direction from the prong. So I feel like it's simpler for the dog, especially with the interior work. It might sound like I'm contradicting myself. Sorry, our gig, and it's what we find works. So we do it. And so we're gonna do sit down, place. We typically start with place, place, and we might do start doing some sits on, on the on the on the walk. Uh, so sit, down, place. Um, and and that's how we get the basic kind of foundation started. And then on the fourth day, unless the dog's already jamming on the second day or something like that, we start going to e-collar and we teach the dog place. So now we've got e-collar heel, probably the beginnings of e-collar sit on the walk, and then we've got e-collar place. And then from there, we start working a little bit more and we might start going for like sit and down, which have been already been conditioned on the prong, so it becomes very easy. And then we start recalling the dog off of place, which is, if you've heard me talk before, far easier than having a dog on a long line and trying to recall a dog that's like trying to blow by you or do something like that. Having a dog stationary, conditioned to a stationary position, recalling them off of it, and then putting them 
on another stationary position, which is another mat for place, and then recalling them off of it, it starts in the small, small context of recall from place to place to place to place, ends up transferring to, to recall to you. People are like, well, then they're just recalling to a mat. No, 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 it transfers very easily to you. Um, the biggest difference is you're teaching a dog to go to a spot and stop and you're avoiding one of the biggest challenges which is dogs when you're trying to teach them recall that 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 want to stick with you and you need to create space and they're like I'm just gonna hang with you uh, I've been recalled a few times or I'm really conditioned to um, healing next to you or I'm very sensitive to leech pressure or I'm very nervous and connected to my owner by teaching place you never have that problem of the gluey velcro dog you can like put them right there in place and call them off and it works like a charm guys and then you just get it spread it wider and wider and more mats and next thing you know your dog's like boing 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 so that's kind of our e-collar program and then just to give you a really brief kind of like how we actually go through the mechanics of it we're using the e-collar um, technologies mini educator we start with I'm trying to roll through we start with um, escape training which is press and hold and give the command at a very very low level just whatever is the motivational level for the dog in that moment in that behavior we press and hold the button guide with the leash and prong because the collar doesn't give direction until the dog is in position button goes off mark it with good rinse and repeat right so first step hold the button escape training till the behavior is done button goes off, mark it with good. Of course, you have, you're adding the command as well. Second, press the button, simultaneously give the command. So let's use sit, sit. As soon as the dog starts to commit towards the sit, button goes off, but hits the ground. Good, right? Third step, prompting, sit with just a quick simultaneous tap. A little bit of uh, leash pressure if the dog needs any help getting into the sit, but hey, Hey, we don't need to growl. Hey, Malu, trying to like horn in on my stuff. Malu. Anyways, that's on me, dog, not mine. Hey, Let's see if the, the boot thing worked. Anyways, so then we go to prompts and that's sit. And if the dog needs help with the leash, you guide him into the sit. They typically don't at prompts. Um, and that's just a quick tap with the command simultaneously. Mark it with good. The final stage is, is uh, corrections, and that is nothing except sit, and then the dog's butt should hit the ground. If it doesn't, repeat the command, tap the button at a level the dog finds motivating until the butt hits the ground, then mark it with good, and that's it, right? pretty pretty straightforward of course you can see a lot more of it if you watch our dvds or you watch our free videos and all that good stuff i hope that helps um and of course that's like a very very simplistic view of it um there's a ton of proofing and if you're getting into behavior mod and all this all this stuff you can go down a rabbit hole and we could talk for months and months and months but that is a brief overview and i hope that helps all right so we're going to spring a last final like bonus question because laura only got to answer she only got to answer one and that's just not fair. This one is super easy and I think she's gonna knock it out. I'm gonna give her like, I'm gonna say she can do this in under a minute. Let's see, all right, let's check it out. Okay, a little bonus question. We wanted to throw this one in here. I'm gonna answer this one. This is from on Instagram, Chelsea Mel C. I think that's what it is. Um, Chelsea Mel C. How do you stop the crying and barking when you leave them at home? Question number six. Um, how do you stop the crying and barking when you leave them at home? Oh, wow, Chelsea Mel C. I have to say this is a little bit more involved than just a single word answer, a single, you know, quick little answer it really depends on like what's going on the rest of the time with your dog if your dog is stellar all the time totally great with people great with other dogs not bratty not running the house not doing anything like that and then they're barking when you're gone you know and crying when you're gone I'm assuming that neighbors are telling you that something for that could just be like a bark collar you know, or like a citronella collar when they bark. 
um, if it's just a dog with mild issues. Another way to do things is you can crate your dog. So if you put your dog in a crate, sometimes they feel more safe with less options to move around. So they're actually just in the crate and they can, they can deal like that. And so you might see less crying and barking. They might just fall asleep. You put like a nice pillow in there, a little, you know, whatever toy or something like that, that they, you don't want them something that they can choke on or anything like that, but you can just make it kind of comfortable for them in the crate. Um, now, if the other way is true, if your dog is kind of bratty all over and you're getting something that like, this is just one of the many things that your dog is doing, you probably want to do some training, <laughs> which means that you train the dog when you're not there or when you're there i'm sorry so that when you're not there you have a dog who's like a little bit more respectful and actually tuning into what is acceptable and all that and sometimes that whining and crying can just be from an anxious place and can be kind of some separation anxiety and the best way to take care of that is not to coddle not to soothe not to anything but to actually give the dog more structure and more rules when you are around so that they feel more secure independent and confident with themselves so when you leave they're just like ah mom's gone cool i can handle this um so the way you go about doing that really you know we've got i would say like the starter pack for training would be like teach your dog place teach your dog how to heal on the on the leash thresholds crate and then you practice that you work with a prong collar with that um, you can layer e-collar work on top of that all of this is in our free videos or you can purchase our dvd um, but the reality is you've got you know you've got to like lay some foundation while you're there so those little four things place command heel and thresholds and crate will get your dog kind of more tuned into you and correcting for stuff that you see while you're there. So you can have a little prong collar on the dog. If someone comes in the house, the dog starts barking, you need to correct and say, that's not cool. So the dog feels more like, oh, okay, there are actually rules. So then he feels more secure again. And when you leave, he can actually handle himself. So it's not the most like perfect answer because I don't know anything about your dog, but it really runs the gamut. You know, if it's really mild dog, you can do kind of like a mild solution. The more severe dog, the more severe and more time intensive the solution is gonna be. And that's really just kind of calling the shots for the dog. Okay guys, thank you so much for dealing with us again. We got through it while the baby's still sleeping. I love you so much. Talk to you soon. Guys, it's always a challenge when we do these long distance things because we never know like who's saying what and where we're at. So there's a little bit of guesswork, but it does make it adventurous and fun. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've had a good time with the Good Dogs Q&A Saturday episode 136, how quickly we forget. Um, we're actually pushing towards episode 200. I mean, and we're starting to move up there. So this is like, are we ready for syndication and some like some big bucks? Mm, who knows? Anyways, I hope you're all well. Um, I'm excited to get the new book stuff out to you guys. Thank you for all the support. So, 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 so much. Um, thank you for uh, being patient on the shipment. I can't wait for the digital. Can't wait for the audio. And then there's some other stuff going on with this uh, big tour coming up with me and Jeffrey Gelman going to um, the UK and we're catching a whole lot of heat going on from the U UK Kennel Club and they are basically saying we're the devil and they're trying to keep us out so we may need some help from some of our UK contacts to help us kind of find uh, a new location um, down London way so um, anybody who has uh, some great insights into a great location um, we're gonna be looking to have approximately 30 people 15 dogs you make some good bread um, if you do host it but you got to be strong and ready to not crumble if the UK bozos kennel club such silliness like they literally applied enough pressure to cause the other person to back out I can't believe it's such bullying BS but at the same time of selling Jeff I was like I kind of feel like we're like kiss you know back in the 70s like going to like play a concert and like the parents are outside like no 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 or even the Beatles well that might be pushing it a bit but it, it's you know when you're doing good work and people are hassling you and like they're pissed off and they're you know angry at you and trying to keep you out 
it's, it's kind of cool. So we, we got a little, we got a little bit of fire juice going on here. And uh, so if anybody has any suggestions on um, a location for, um, we were in West Sussex and we're contemplating East Sussex. I mean, we're trying to kind of stay in the same location to make it convenient. But if anybody has any suggestions for us down in that area with some land and uh, wanting to make some bucks, and um, help out me and Jeff to put on a seminar that's going to kick some royal ass. I added that in there for you guys. Um, please email me at oshandy, O-S-H-A-N-D-Y, at gmail.com, and uh, we'll see if we can bamboozle these guys. All right? Hope you guys are all good. Have an awesome, 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 awesome week, and uh, I will chat with all you guys soon. All right? Take care. Mm-hmm.